Yeah. Um, my name is Dan Miles. I uh, work for Historic England, um, and I am uh, the lead on the Sector the Net Zero project. Um, I'm going to give, I'm in the Sector Resilience and Skills team. So basically, we undertake a lot of work supporting the heritage sector as a whole guidance, training, apprenticeships. Uh, research frameworks, knowledge transfer, that whole sort of area. One of the things that we support is the resilience. The uh, Historic Environment Forum has a sector resilience plan. This looks at sort of, you know, long term thinking about the resilience of the sector, diversity, skills. One of them is climate change. This is part of the work to support climate change. And that's where the sort of the resilience bit comes in and why I'm involved in it. I am not uh, a specialist in environmental sustainability or in net zero. Speaker later on, Chris, who's at the back, is an expert. So any questions, ask him, please. But I will just give a bit of an introduction to why we're doing it. Uh, partly, or at, no, in fact, the reason we're doing it is not this March, but last March, part of Historic England's funding agreement from DCMS highlighted two areas in, in, amongst others. One of them is that we have to, Historic England has to sort out its own net zero. So that's a big piece of work that we're doing. And the other one gave us this little tiny task of supporting heritage organisations on their journey to net zero. So that's where it sort of fits in. Before I go into the project and I will also talk about some of the other work and some of the archaeology and the broader stuff. I just thought it would be useful just as sort of like to, I'm, I'm sure everyone here knows all about net zero but just in case I just thought some of the drivers for why we basically need to do this and there's sort of three main areas. One is the legislation that sets out, the strategy sets out that by 2050 we have to be net zero and this includes SMEs so heritage SMEs, archaeology companies, all the different organisations. The second one, which actually is really probably a lot more applicable to the archaeological commercial sector, is the financial and the compliance. And I know that Chris is going to be talking about that a bit later on as well. But it's that idea that organisations have to report if they're at a certain size. I spoke to Kenneth a few months back about this, and this comes under the streamlined energy and carbon reporting system. There are no archaeological companies who are at the size who have to do mandatory reporting. However, other organisations do, other large companies, including government agencies, and they therefore are required to ask you to report to them. And this is where a lot of the work that's coming through with the national highways and others. So you are basically their scope three reporting your emissions as part of their emissions because they have to do mandatory emissions. So it's that type of thing. This is where it comes into the supply chain reporting emissions, but it's also, it's now starting a lot of the projects for, organize, for companies to say, as part of your tender, what are you doing about environmental sustainability? This is this idea of having sort of green credentials. It's becoming much more as part of the thing across not just the heritage sector or even the development sector, but the whole, whole of um, the UK. There is also things like environmental compliance, working on sites, certain amount of sites are now saying none of the, um, what's it called, the plastic security fencing, you're not allowed to use that you'll have to think about alternatives. There's more and more of this coming in because it's uh, not using uh, single-use plastic, et cetera. And then things like the grants. So Historic England are starting to think about this. Historic Environment Scotland are already. Lottery, Arts Council. If you're applying for grants, they would like to see that you are working towards net zero. They were thinking about that. So it's becoming all across, and it's not just for the commercial sector, it's also for charitable organisations, even philanthropic, uh, charity, uh, philanthropic grants are asking the same questions. And then the last one, and probably even more important, is the actual ethical sort of uh, the driver. Popular concern, concern of your own staff, concern of your own families, concern of everyone involved thinking about what is the future going to be and then thinking about ethical practices of organisations with your stakeholders, with your trustees, with your boards, and having that. And it's also the big one, again, which 
is part of the financial is reputational gain the green credentials thinking about it like that so i just thought it was really like a little intro just to sort of thinking about why we're, we're moving towards this so the aim of the net zero project and luckily i don't have i am not responsible for everyone in this audience or any other heritage organization to be net zero because that is, is is way too much but it's the project is to raise awareness and support heritage heritage organizations on the journey so the three things and this is where i want to get to in the next couple of years is that heritage organizations have a under, better understanding of their carbon footprint they have plans set out to make to think about how they can reduce emissions and probably the most important is that they're confident in taking the next steps and those next steps could be putting in time and resource money into making those big changes if you are a heritage property owner that could be looking at retrofit solar panels heat pumps if you are an archaeological company that could be moving over to a fleet of electric vehicles that's a cost impact so it's thinking about do you have that enough understanding are you confident you can make those decisions you know where that's going so that's the sort of the aim of the project um, when i talk about heritage organizations this is where it gets slightly wider for me it's all heritage smes dcms only ask for sort of small asks you know so it's all heritage small medium enterprises which is probably 99 0.9% of all heritage organizations in the country. It's only National Trust, English Heritage, etc., who are sort of the larger size. But that is when well, we're trying to break it down into organizations that manage a heritage site, run a heritage site, uh, Cromford Mill, um, historic houses, castles, that whole sort of area. People who are properties are open to the public, Fishbourne Roman Palace, et cetera, et cetera. That sort of those things. And then it's others who are providing heritage services. That goes from fame, CIFA, all the way through to archaeological companies, to conservation, to architectural historians. So it's the whole range of services. And it also includes, because it, no one really thinks about it, it's the micro, the small, and it's the volunteer led. So it's only a tiny, tiny task, especially when we don't really understand the full scope of what our heritage organizations or how many there are out there. But let's not worry about it. I could probably spend the next two years trying to calculate that. So it, again, what Neil, I think, said earlier is not having the data is really, really interesting. So the time frame, the last year uh, was the consultation. So we did a survey. We've had lots of strategic discussions. I've spoken to CIFA, I've spoken to fame as part of that we also did roundtable discussions which was really good we had three archaeological ones one with the maritime side of things and then two of these sort of lunch and learns through CIFA um, survey I said that and that was really really useful there's a report coming out soon that sets it out I'll give you a few ideas of some of the results and then it's the next steps the next steps we are now in phase two support two years uh, it might be a bit longer because I don't think we're going to sort everything out in the next two years. So, but it's actually part of this, continu uh, this continuous support for actually organisations and thinking about um, net zero and environmental sustainability in its broader context. So some results just, and I don't think any of these will be surprising really. And people who have been at the National Highways Foundation uh, framework meeting, I'm sorry, this is very similar slides, but I'll I will move talk about something slightly different. Uh, this was just about confidence, and it's just saying that sort of the results are 91% of organisations need some support. I'm really interested in knowing who the 2.5% are extremely confident, but let's it's anonymized data. Uh, that sort of sets out this this level of confidence, and that's what I'm trying to think about: people being confident and making decisions and moving forwards. And these two are the sort of the classic start off. If you're looking at net zero, you need to have the data. You need to have your own data about your own carbon footprint. Only 17% of organizations have measured their carbon footprint and only 14% have actually got a carbon reduction plan. Uh, this is, I think is quite telling and we'll talk about some of the barriers, but it's an interesting one of 
you know, this is sort of the core figures. It also sets out why we need to support organisations and we can tell DCMS this is why and et cetera, and can we have some money. Um, very quickly, going to look at the barriers. Oh, it has come up well, good. Uh, not surprising, I don't think. For these are sort of the barriers for thinking about uh, the steps to be net zero, but also in how you're going to achieve it. So I think it's the sort of two distinct things part of the journey. The four main ones are in-house skills and knowledge, just don't have the expertise, the understandings of what we need to do. Staff and volunteer time particularly for your small, really small organisations, especially volunteer-led. People are doing job sharing. People are having different roles and responsibilities. They're taking stuff on. I'm sure that's probably happening in, in the archaeological companies that are, are represented here. It's that. Cost of one-off adaptations is exactly what we're you know, thinking about. You know, you're moving over to a new fleet of vehicles. You will need some retrofit. This is a, a big investment and then access to funding. Who is going to pay for that? Is there grants out there? How can you get them? Uh, not, you know, I think probably everyone here would recognize those and say, yeah, it's probably similar in my organization or in other organizations that you know about. When we did the, uh, the sort of the round table discussions, we had much more of a flowing discussion about different things. I've just put some of these up here. Um, Remember, this is across all heritage organizations, so it's not just archaeology. So I'm not sure about how many here are, are concerned about coal, but a lot, a lot of the heritages are very concerned. The steamings, steam engines, the railway, heritage railway, not just about the impact on carbon and what they need to do, but also the cost. A lot of this is very heavily involved in the cost of living crisis, energy efficiency. So it's all entwined. But what is interesting is things like it's the cost come up, the funding, things like stuff that's completely out of our control, grid capacity, especially in rural areas. You want to put uh, electric vehicle charging points. There isn't capacity. You can't do it. Things like rural versus urban. We all, it's, it's there. It's there all the time. Um, you have a heritage site in the countryside. There's only way to get there is by car private car, there are no buses, local transport's knackered. Thinking about that, urban's a lot easier, you can put cycle schemes on things, so there's that disparity, how can we support them? But the skills gaps, internal and external, so the internal thinking about what do we need to be able to do this, but also do we, are we, do we have confidence in the people that will advise us on this vehicle or this heat pump? Can we trust that they understand our uses? You know, it's easy to get an electric car. What about electric four wheel drive? Or what about the, is there the capacity of electric plant out there that can do the same job as what you need it for? So there's all these questions. So it's having that confidence. And a lot of this spills into this sort of this, this barriers that have been breaking it down into clarity and trust and confidence. And the clarity is right at the beginning for lots of people. So where do I start? You Google carbon emissions, carbon reduction, there's millions. You know, where do I start? What information? Where can I find the information? What support is out there? And then the next bit is, how do I know it's any good? There's tons of carbon calculators out there. There's tons of different stuff out there to support me. But is that related to my organization? Carbon and all this stuff and how we measure it and how it's reported is exactly the same across all organizations. It's not like a heritage flavor. It's just we understand better if it's wrapped around with the heritage examples, case studies. We trust our own colleagues because we work in the same environment. And I think that's really important. So we need to think about that. And then that leads to that confidence. Uh, am I confident that I know what I'm doing, that we can make those investments, we can take those time and move them forward? So the support, uh, which was flagged, uh, training, in carbon literacy, in how to calculate carbon emissions, so this carbon accounting. Uh, big one is signposting to good guidance, basically trusted guidance. What is there, that, you know, rather than do a Google search and finding anything, is there stuff that we can say, actually, this is quite good? And then who has the right to say that? And thinking about that quality assurance, which is interesting. 
uh, tailored resources, tailored examples. What's Wessex done? Has it been working well? Can people think about that, especially the smaller organisations who don't have people who are actually in post? Because I know a number of the larger organisations do have people in post or they have environmental sustainability um, consultants that come in and advise them. What about the smaller organisations? How can they learn? How can we share that? That goes into that peer-to-peer -peer support, thinking about how we can run those. You can run training. Everyone goes to training, it's great. Two weeks later, you've forgotten about it unless you apply it directly. Is there a way of continuing that training? These online communities, sharing experiences, and then thinking about funding and grants, um, capital grants for retrofit, et cetera, things like that, but also things like enabling grants. If you've got a building and you want to see, you do an energy efficiency audit, you want to be able to understand where you are before you make decisions. So it's those sort of areas. Unfortunately, we're not doing all that support because it's, it's a long, long way. But some of the sort of the things we've been thinking about doing and rolling out, and this is where it's really important, is it's not a historic England supporting the sector. It's got to work with those sector representative bodies, whether that's FAME, whether it's CIFA, whether it's the Heritage Alliance or the, um, I don't know, Association of Independent Museums or whoever it is. It's working with those organisations who are the representatives of their members and of the sectors. So that's really, really key. And we're thinking about simple first one is doing a uh, delivery of a heritage carbon literacy course. So we've recreating a heritage course based on the museum one, which has been very successful. I don't know how many people here have done the carbon literacy course. Wow. Impressive. That's none, by the way. <laughs> Normally there's two or three, <laughs> but that's interesting. That is very, very much looking at behavior change of people in the organizations, that bottom up, making people think about everyday tasks, how you could improve things. A lot of people do it anyway. You've got your recycling bins, you've got this, but it's just making people think about it in terms of carbon. And it sets out pledges for how you can improve things. It's very much an introduction to understanding what needs to be done. Whereas the next one is the carbon accounting support. And that's where you think scope one, scope two, don't worry about scope three. Maybe you do, but not yet. Thinking about what do you do? How do you measure your carbon footprint? What's the best way to do it? There are people here in your organizations who are already doing it. Great, fantastic. There's a lot of other organizations who aren't. That's really key. You need to know your footprint. You need to know what your uh, outputs and missions are before you can start thinking about reducing them. That's the sort of the generic thinking. Um, we need to look broader the museum sector, cultural heritage sector, because as I say, carbon reduction stuff is the same. We need to be, sort of work together a bit more. The peer-to-peer -peer support, um, and then the access to specialist advice. You know, are there opportunities to say, let's have a, I don't know, lunch and learn, or one of those with someone who's a consultant could then come in and people can say, so I've got, I'm gonna work out my scope three, how do I do it? And you can have these conversations. So there's different ways of thinking about it. So just to talk a bit about, just to end, um, I've got timers have gone a bit astray, so I'm not exactly sure how long it is, but, um, okay, good. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, we need to work collaboratively. This is the archaeology sector with CIFA and FAME to support archaeological organisations. And then we need to support ourselves as archaeological organisations. The carbon literacy training is one of the planned initiatives. So um, we'll be rolling out some training. The course is being accredited in October, September, October. We're thinking about how we can roll that out. It will most likely be through sector representative bodies for example see for fame but that's a, a conversation but that training will be for people for organizations um carbon accounting we also need to think about how we can roll out some carbon accounting training or some better advice some of these drop-in work uh, opportunities 
that's something that's really interesting. And then thinking about that peer-to-peer -peer support and resources. And I know that Alex Llewellyn, who's leading this for CIFA, is already thinking about having a sort of online area where people can share resources, but also be able to ask questions. So she's thinking about that as one of the things coming from the CIFA working group. So some of the current initiatives, um, these are sort of uh, the CIFA ones that they have. Uh, there is a climate change working group with good representation from the commercial sector, local authorities, academia, national organizations. I'm trying to look around here. Andy's here. Andy Boucher is one of the people. I'm trying to think other of the Hannah Morell of MOLA is also in it. And there's other people. It's a really, really good working group, done some fantastic stuff, uh, and it's moving forward. One of the things they've done is the carbon reduction guide table. That's already published. That sets out things to think about how to do it. They had the conference in Nottingham, and there's, the, there's a session at the next innovation festival, which will be on carbon reduction and thinking about these areas. So some really good stuff out there, and it's working really well. Um, one of the other initiatives, again, some of you have been involved in some of these workshops, but National Highways was thinking about their frameworks of the organisations that work for them on their projects. They've really gone whole hog on net zero and everything. And they are, let me think, you have to be, they are looking on their projects by 2030 net zero. And I think organisations have to be passed by 2026, something like that, 25. It's all right, you've got a couple of years. <laughs> got a few more years for the net zero. That, that's quite, that's, um, that's, they're really pushing the things forward, which is great, but there is a lot of things to be considered and where we move forward. So Caroline Rayner uh, was doing some work for the highways in looking at this is, I'm just going to read this one, see if I can read it with my left eye. Benchmark archaeological activities and map the activity products, techniques which contribute to the generation of carbon against each stage of the construction program and PCF life cycle. So there's different life cycles on there. This has been a really, really useful exercise. It's been really interesting. It's mapping those things. What part of the archaeological process are generating carbon emissions and thinking about it from the plant, from setting up the compound to the um, thinking about the archive, digital, all these things there. Just one example, I mean, it's not worried to read it, is there, it's just, you know, this is one of the sections was transportation and plant, thinking about mitigations, opportunities and ease of implementation, staff transportation, transportation of fines and samples, plant emissions. So all these basic things, these are the, the emitters and what therefore you can think about it and potential ways or challenges of reducing them. It's been a really useful exercise. There is another workshop thinking about it in terms of sorting out. It's, it's more to do with their own carbon calculator, but what we are being able to use and we've spoken to the highways is to take all the information that's been generated from Caroline and the workshops and create something from that that will be useful for the whole sector. So it's not proprietary work from the highways. This will be for us to be able to take out and talk to with Alex Llewellyn and see for and see how we can make into something very, very useful. This will be a really good way of a, like creating a roadmap to thinking about the missions are here. What can you do and think about it? Um, so, the last couple of slides, um, this is to do with that last piece of work with National Highways, understand better the carbon impact of archaeological intentions. We need some data, we need to get some information. I think people here, Andy will probably be able to tell you, but I think it's plant is the biggest emitters. Is it that? Yeah, so there's, it's, it's, so we need to get this. We need to define these things and then be able to say, right, so we've got these things. How can we work out? How can we start thinking about them, reducing them? And that is as a sector, 
not as individual organisations. You all have to do it as individual organisations, but if we do it as a sector, we'll actually be able to achieve it. So it's things like, you know, the transport, but, then, but also things like impact on embedded carbon in the topsoil. Things about that, there's quite a lot of information we don't have. I know on the grand schemes of it, it's probably a tiny amount of carbon, but actually it, it's what people identify and see is archaeology is a destructive process. We're removing topsoil. People will go, hold on a minute, that's got embedded carbon in it. And actually we need to be able to work these things out and saying, yeah, but it's actually this amount compared to et cetera. Uh, archives, physical and digital. Digital has a large carbon footprint. You know, all those servers in Qatar have huge amounts of uh, air conditioning, you know, spewing out. Everyone says, oh, it's all on the, on the cloud. Yeah, but it's somewhere, isn't it? It's just yours is on the cloud, <laughs> thinking about that. As a scope three, downstreaming carbon something, technically or potentially the contractor is responsible for the carbon of the archive when you deposit it with the museum. So when we start talking about not box charges, other charging, we should also start thinking about what actually is that the emissions of your archive being there. Does that mean that we have to select much more? We already start the selection toolkits already out there. We're thinking about this, but you know, are we selecting it because of research, but actually are we selecting it and being driven by the impact on carbon? So it's things to consider. We need to develop a set of standard agreed carbon metrics for archeological interventions. This has all been imposed on us by other organizations, the highways with their calculators, we need to feed our data in them. It would be really great that we actually say, look, this is the metrics that work from us because this ton of carbon is too big for us. It's we need to think about it. We need to take responsibility for that because otherwise everything gets imposed and we need to be able to say, look, the actual carbon footprint of our work is tiny compared to development, but we need to justify that. And then things like coming out of the infrastructure and development side of things, working with other organisations like the CBA, the academic sector, to just think about getting some advice and guidance out there for them. But talking to Neil, he's happy with community archaeology because it's local groups in local areas and there's no travel and stuff like that. But it's got a good point. He's going back to that local excavations and maybe that has an impact on future models for the sector anyway. Um, my own views, purely something that I was just thinking about. A lot of them are coming from the workshops we've had, but I put that just in case someone says, Historic England said, no, they didn't, because they don't know about this stuff, because actually a lot of this work, thank you, Kenneth. <laughs> a lot of this stuff is from the sector, and that's where it comes in. But, and I think it's very clear from the highways workshops that net zero will change how we plan, design and undertake archaeological work. It's already doing so and it will change it more. The compliance and reporting will become mandatory. It already is and it is for if you work on the highways and other big schemes. It will become more and more as this stuff comes through the local authorities, development planning system is there. Carbon accounting, if you ever go on a carbon accounting course, there's loads of people out there doing carbon accounting courses. This is a new business. And actually, you will be, I think you'll be reporting it on an annual basis, like you do to your tax at HMRC. But, you know, so therefore you pay someone to do it, fantastic. But you always need to know, you always have to get your books ready to then send to your accountant. Having that understanding is really important. Um, people have already been talking about carbon or development scheme, carbon budgets. So there's a budget for a development. What does that mean? What does that mean for archaeology? Does that mean that, oh, we might not do this evaluation, this work because it's quite high carbon and actually we can remove that because we've got something else. That's just pure hypothesis. But that's where I think if we can understand our emissions and own it, we can then say, yeah, 0.4% of the carbon emissions of this development is through the archaeological process. Therefore, don't cut it. It's very much like the piece of work that was done a few years ago, looking at the cost of archaeological interventions as part of the development system, where you know per pound it was whatever it was, zero point something percent of the overgrown scheme. It's that type of thing. Again, my own views, but I just think there's going to be a pressure, there's going to be a push on carbon budgets, and we'll see what happens. 
but there's also lots and lots of opportunities. It's not all negative, it's positive. It's innovation, like we can think about these things. New forms of valuation, we've already seen some bits and pieces out there. Um, there was something on the news when I was up in Nottingham from ARS talking about their work. That's great, people are thinking about it. There's a focus on research and public benefit, the social value of archeology, span thinking about how we can move that. And this did get this, this is the last one, I don't, I don't think you can see it all. At the last highways meeting, there was this thing saying, does that mean we're gonna dig less? And there's that fear of digging less because that impacts on everyone's models of working, et cetera. But it's not, it's this idea we need to dig smarter, dig better and dig more informed. I think that's really, really crucial. And that is the positive. We'll, we'll be moving forward and be able to innovate and move more. And I think that is it from me. Thank you.